Galatians 3, 26 to 29. Okay, ready? One, two, three, four. For in Christ, Christ Jesus, Jesus, you are all sons of God, God through faith. For as, as many, many of you as, as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Lord Jesus, we thank you for bringing us together by the power of the Holy Spirit and the profession of faith uh, into one body that we are one new man, yes. and that we are equal in this. And uh, God, we, we pray for you to do a powerful work in, in unifying us and giving us full revelation of what this means, that we have been baptized into one body, into Christ. And Lord, we pray that we are quickened and awake, that we receive your word as you intend it, that there is no distortion of the gospel or your uh, doctrine or your heart or your will. We receive what you have for us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I was prompted by a few things by the selection of those verses. Um, one, of course, we have the baptism today with Michael, which is, I just always love these days. The last one of our group was Alex, and then my wife's father was baptized uh, a few weeks ago. So, uh, but it's joyful, so joyful. It's talk, talking about the harvest. I mean, this is what it means to put something in the basket as an offering up to our Lord, and that's you, that's your soul. Um, but there's a lot going on, obviously, in our nation and around the world. Uh, clearly, there's a spirit of division that's attacking people, attacking this nation, attacking our churches, attacking races, and uh, this, uh, there's a, there are a lot of cause for uh, disgruntlement and anger and uh, bitterness. Well, thankfully, thank God that as Christians, we are part of an earthly nation and we are governed by a, a government here in America. Uh, or wherever we are, and uh, but there's something greater than that. We've been brought into a new kingdom. Our primary citizenship is in heaven. Amen. We have a new government that takes preeminence over every other law and government. And we have a king, a king forever, and that's our Lord Jesus Christ. And when you said yes to the Lord, that in faith you believed in your heart and you said with your mouth that Jesus is my Lord, you became part of the kingdom of God. And uh, through baptism, we are expressing that. We are dying to ourselves. We're dying to our old way of thinking and to worldliness, our sinful lives. And we are joining Christ in his death as we come up as a new creation as a son, as a daughter of God, and that we are alive in a new kingdom with new rules and a new heart. And our kingdom is amazing. There is no division in the body of Christ by proclamation of the king. And he not only says you're citizens of heaven, but you are family. You are brothers and sisters. And you, we all are entering into the household of our Father. We are all brothers and sisters, regardless of whether we are Jew or Greek, male or female, whether we are rich or poor, black or white, Latino or Asian, it does not matter. We have joined the body of Christ. And we have that expectation of a heavenly call that not only puts us together, right now is a body of Christ, but in heaven, eternity. And for those who don't like the idea of being joined together with people of this different races or uh, economic backgrounds or whatever, you've got a long disappointment ahead of you. <laughs> because if you're going to heaven, you're gonna be a part of every nation 
And the body of Christ looks like that. And you can't hate your own body. You have hatred towards anybody because of their ethnicity or whatever. You hate yourself. We know from Revelation 7, 9 to 10, what heaven looks like and what the body of Christ is supposed to look like. After this, I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That's what you and I will be doing when we go to heaven. And we should be doing it right now as we thank God for our church that we're so diverse. Teaches us what the body of Christ is supposed to look like and what it will always look like. Well, God is a God who rules as a king. He's not, he hasn't called us into a democracy. There are no protests in heaven. <laughs> and there, there was one protest that it cost someone very dearly. Uh, Satan was kicked out and he didn't get the concept of a kingship with our father sitting on the, on the throne, Jesus sitting on the throne. In God's kingdom, it is not a vote. There is no democracy. He says, and we do. And thank God that he is just, and he is fair, and he is loving, and he is kind, and he is all-knowing, and he is all-powerful, and we can trust him. We trust everything that proceeds from the mouth of God. We trust his heart. We trust his rule and his authority, and he never makes a mistake in his judgments. And we honor and we obey our king. We go along as humble servants, receiving his love, loving him back, and loving one another. And Jesus said in John 18, 36, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Remember this, brothers and sisters. When we see injustice in this world, it is not his world. It is not his kingdom. And when we see things that are not fair, not equal, not right, it isn't because of his judgments. It's because of the failure of mankind. It is because Satan is ruling in this world. And it is up to us to bring thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. It is for us to expose this dark world, not to more protest and more anger, not to injustice, not to uh, unjust um, laws or the enforcement of laws in an unjust way. It is for us to bring the kingdom of heaven, to pray the kingdom of heaven into this world and to act as light into a place of darkness. We bring love. We bring healing. We bring the kingdom of God. And we bring the gospel that allows people to have changed hearts. We bring the Holy Spirit that brings healing, that brings love, that brings resurrection power, and will enable through the gospel for salvation from this wretched world, from this wretched place dominated by division of Satan, hatred, anger, prejudice, the abuse of justice, and that will all melt away one heart at a time as you and I bring the kingdom of God, not anger, not wrath, not hatred. We can only win and change this world piece by piece through the gospel. And it is Christ in us that brings change. It is Christ in us. It is the Holy Spirit and having a new heart that brings lasting and meaningful change. And we can have changes in laws in this nation. That's fine if they bring justice. But it won't change hearts. I, when I was in the Air Force, I was in charge of recruiting for the Air Force Academy and RO, Air Force ROTC in the Western region. And um, one of my jobs was to bring, to try to get minorities uh, recruited into the Air Force. Now, try to picture this. My, my base, <laughs> Sherry, <laughs> my base was in Salt Lake City, Utah. 
<laughs> this is white, white, white. <laughs> and my, but I had to find minorities. I had to go out high and low. So I brought out, uh, I asked for them to send to me this, <laughs> a, a black lieutenant. So they, they said, I remember his name, Chris Daniels, Lieutenant Daniels. And, and Lieutenant Daniels and I, we went all over the place trying to rustle up a minority recruitment. <laughs> and um, well, we, it was funny because when he came to Salt Lake City, we had a special visitor come to the campus at the University of Utah. And I said, Lieutenant Daniels, you're gonna enjoy this. We're gonna go see Rosa Parks. And Rosa Parks spoke at the University of Utah. And uh, it was a small crowd. I, I was really impressed with Mrs. Parks. Um, she was very intelligent. She was about 80, 81 years old, but still really sharp and a sweet, wonderful person. And I knew that the story told about her refusing to get up on the bus uh, was a little distorted because this was no accident. I know that the civil rights uh, movement must have picked her. She's a very unique person. Um, and anybody who would hate Rosa Parks is completely screwed up. She's the nicest woman I ever. We, we actually went around the back afterwards. We were walking back to the Air Force detachment. And we see this little lady standing in the parking lot all alone. And it was Rosa Parks. I said, Lieutenant Daniels, hurry up. Let's go meet Rosa Parks. So we went over and uh, we both hugged her and she was so sweet and kind. I know she was so happy to see Lieutenant Daniels in his Air Force uniform. And I, it was just an amazing moment. And it's kind of, Lieutenant Daniels was a bit speechless. <laughs> but anyway, I, um, I was so, so blessed in this. So, but anyway, my, my efforts to try to recruit minority people was fruitless in Utah. I just couldn't get anything done in spite of all my efforts. Well, I also noticed that even if we, if we did succeed in that, oh, hey, even if we had succeeded in getting our numbers together, it would never have undone racism and hatred because that's in the heart. That's a spiritual problem. You can't just have affirmative action and changes in laws. They're not going to change hearts. Only God can change the heart. So by protesting, I don't blame people for protesting over injustice or, or even uh, racial inequalities. That's okay. You can do that. But as a Christian, remember this. We have something much greater to offer and to achieve. And it is about the harvest of souls. We don't just want to have a whole bunch of new laws. We want new hearts. We want people that don't just uh, placate others to bring up the numbers of minorities in, a, in an office or in a, an agency or whatever, or you know whatever that is. That's not gonna solve the problem. There's still hatred. There's still passive uh, hatred and, and prejudice. And it's not just white people hating other people. You gotta understand this. I think we all know. I've, I've, I've heard and experienced prejudice from every single ethnic group. You know, a lot of people don't know why my wife is Asian. So I'm like a spy. I move about among people that say things and they don't think it's gonna offend me. Well, surprise. It does. <laughs> so, I, but I've learned instead of pulling out my baseball bat and wrapping them over the head as I would have done before I was saved, and believe me, there are a couple people that <laughs> wish they hadn't have said things <laughs> that really set me off. And I used to be a pretty strong guy, and uh, to get me riled up wasn't a good idea. But anyway, um, I've learned that's not the way to change hearts. <laughs> So I, when I hear prejudice, I gradually try to move more like a caterpillar, you know, trying to understand what they're experiencing and who they are and, and gradually exposing them so they can understand uh, their prejudice uh, and, and make, you know, hopefully there's, there's a change of heart. Actually, let me just tell one more story to give you work. Well, when I was in, the, in Utah um, as a captain in the Air Force, uh, you know, I stood out with an Asian wife in Utah, so that's a little odd anyway. You gotta be there to understand what I'm talking about. It's a very uh, racist place. And um, well, one time I took Jennifer to a trip to Korea on an Air Force Space A flight. And, and just before we had arrived, an American 
killed his Korean girlfriend with an umbrella. It was a horrendous murder. And the Koreans were so angry. They were angry at Americans, and they, especially if they saw an American with an Asian. We were refused service in different restaurants and thrown out of stores, and they were rude about it, not nice. And uh, I, was, <laughs> I was really angry. But I, I came back, and it, it, it revealed to me something that um, was very visceral. I, I felt prejudice on a, on a level that I had never experienced before. When someone refuses you service and denies you, they treat you like you're an inhuman. You're not human. And I'm an Air Force officer. I, I mean, I'm teaching at the University of Utah. I got a, my master's degree. I got all this other stuff. And you're going to treat me like that? You know, well, it, it made me realize this is what it really is like for uh, many different people. And um, I wrote an article in the newspaper uh, called The Tables Are Turned. And um, I expressed the feelings that I had when there was racial prejudice against me, a white man. And um, I got uh, a response that I did not expect. So I got a, a note, come, another guy <laughs> responds, and uh, he's trying to justify, I guess, racism or whatever. I, I forget what his note was. And he was, he was like arguing with me. So I wrote another letter expressing how this guy was a fool. <laughs> and uh, now remember, I wasn't saying, but I was very, it was a very uh, 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 carefully written note. I wasn't, I wasn't throwing a street fight. Well, I got a phone call not long after that, and it was a death threat. They threatened to kill me. And they said, if I wrote anything against so and, brother so-and-so that they were gonna do something to me and my family. So I called the NAACP. And I spoke to this elderly woman and I said, what do you do when people threaten you? And she laughed and she said, I've had bullets go through my window. I've had a bomb in my mailbox. And she laughed and said, there's nothing you can do about it. So I was like, whoa, what did I get into here? <laughs> you know, I was really exposed to this whole thing as a white man. I think God allowed this to happen even before I got saved so that I could understand, you know, what is it like? Um, and uh, I'll never forget this. Uh, so, and as a Christian, I, I mean, I really, I love everybody. I, I, I really do. And um, that's the way we have to be. We have to have this, we have to ask God to ex help us understand what it feels like to be another person. Now, I've seen prejudice. I've traveled all over the world and I've had different groups uh, respond to me in different ways. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just, just be aware. You don't even know how prejudiced you are till the Holy Spirit starts to pull it out of you. And, and really, it's not something Jesus will not tolerate this. He, he doesn't want this. This is not of, of Christians. But what we don't want to do is become rebels and lawless. Now, Paul tells us that the man of lawlessness, which is the Antichrist, will come and rule in this world. And if you're, I've heard people say, why do we need the police force? I, they're just off their tree. I, I, I mean, without law enforcement, what would you have? You would have lawlessness. And right now, I know there's a lot of people, they're upset, of course, about the death of George Floyd and all the other issues. I'm not just saying that's the only case, but the murder of what appears to be a murder of George Floyd by a white police officer with the assistance, I might add, of a black police officer, an Asian police officer, and another white police officer. And if, if you look at police uh, across the nation, I was going through the demographics of police forces in the major cities and they are largely comprised of minorities. I mean, it might still be a 60% a white, but you've got about 40% that are African-American, Latinos, and Asian officers. So we're not talking, this is not strictly a, a white and black issue. This, there's something else going on here. And it could just be, you know, and what you don't want to do is have a reverse prejudice where everybody hates all police officers. That's totally unfair. You've got some police officers that are making mistakes. They're not, ex it's not the job of a police officer to execute justice like that. You take them in to the legal system, you arrest them. 
That's the police officer's job. And yes, if there's a resistance of arrest, you may need to use force and sometimes lethal force. But if you've got a man in handcuffs or whatever and he's on the ground, it's not your job to kill him. It's your job to get him alive into the jail so that the legal process can then go through the evidence and deal with them. That's the way it works in America, right? The way it's supposed to work in America. Now, but God is a God of justice and he is impartial. He's holding all of us responsible to obey not just the laws of a nation, but where the laws of a nation co contradict the laws of God, he says, obey my laws. And we saw that in Acts 5 when uh, the, 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 the apostles were told not to preach in the name of Jesus by the Jewish uh, uh, authorities, and they did anyway. And then they were rounded up again, and they said, we thought we told you not to do this. And then uh, I believe it's Peter. Peter does respond in Acts 5, 29. He says, uh, we must obey God rather than man. And um, so in general, though, uh, we know that we're supposed to obey the law. And we're told that in Romans 13, um, where... Uh, um, please forgive me for one moment, that the, the man of law, the governing authority, does not bear a sword for, for nothing. Right? So, um, in fact, we're told that governing authorities, <clears throat> it's Romans 13, 1 to 8, <clears throat> verse 1, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment, for rulers are not a terror to, do, to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to God, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. So when we say we don't want police officers or people are out there abusing the police, they're coming against God's servants. Now, not all of them are, are doing what they're supposed to do, but you deal with it on a case-by-case -case basis, the way our legal system is supposed to operate. That's called due process. So if you have a guy who clearly has a, a murdered a, a man held in his custody, you take him to trial, you put him in jail, and just like every other law breaker, that police officer will stand before a court of law but there's no room in God's kingdom for vigilante justice. You can't just go kill someone or say that they're guilty before you have heard the evidence and bear witness of at least two witnesses. You know, it's in God's law book. So uh, now in particular, as a Christian, we can't just go out as rebels violating the law, even if there's a just cause. You don't just go out and hit evil with evil. God will hold you accountable. And not all police officers are violating the law. And they're there for a reason. And we need to respect them. And the ones that are bad, we'll deal with them. And if we don't, I've got news for you. There's another court date that we're all going to be standing in front of a judge for. And every hidden sin, every injustice by a police officer, you know, George Floyd was in innocent there. I'm not saying he should have been killed, but he was violating the law from what I can tell, and he was being arrested. The problem was they didn't do it properly. And to turn him into a hero is wrong. God says he holds all wicked, all lawbreakers accountable. He's holding George Floyd accountable. He's holding the police officer accountable. 
He's holding all those that prevented justice from being, you know, done when the, uh, the, the other three police officers, they're, now they're in jail, thank God. I mean, not that I'm saying they're, they still have to go through the legal process. I'm not saying they're guilty while they haven't been proven guilty yet. I mean, it, we can all look at the evidence on TV. That's another story. But they're not going to get away with it. We know that everyone, every one of us will stand before God's throne, and every man will be judged according to the deeds he has done in the body, whether evil or good. And God judges the heart. 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. If you can find it before me, welcome. He judges the heart. So now you've got all these people protesting this injustice, and I'm not saying they're wrong. In this nation, we have a right to protest lawfully, legally. We don't have a right to destroy somebody's property. We don't have a right to burn down a shop owner's store uh, when they had nothing to do with this. We don't have a right to loot and steal and throw things at police cars and throw things at the police. We don't. That's lawlessness. It's against God's law. It's against our nation's laws. Now, thankfully, I understand that there might be fewer of these incidents, incidents occurring. I hope so. Uh, but nevertheless, don't think you're going to get away with anything. There are many criminals who are in a police uniform. There are many criminals who are protesting. There are criminals who are going to church today. And I'm not just talking about breaking the laws of this nation, but I'm talking about God's laws. And remember, he's judging the heart. He says in uh, Matthew 5, 21, 22, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you, that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother Raka, which means fool, shall be in danger of the council. For whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hell fire. Matthew 5, 27 and 28. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You're, there are people going to hell and going to be judged as criminals before God who don't even know it. They say, well, I didn't do anything illegal. I didn't rape that woman. I didn't murder that person. But God says, no, I'm looking at your heart. I'm going to judge you for anger. I'm going to judge you for lust. And I'm going to hold you accountable for it. And there are people out there raising a, a, all hell in protest and police reacting with, with a hellish reaction, and, and they're all guilty. But the news is just showing you what's going on on an earthly level. But God's not looking at that only. He's looking at your heart. And don't allow anger and hatred to go against the police or another race. If there are white people that are prejudiced against black people and then a black person becomes angry against that white person, God's going to judge that black person for their anger against the white person. It does, you know, you're not off the hook. The white person's going to be judged for their prejudice and their anger. Everybody, look, we're all, at the, we're all going to be judged. And there's a lot of things going on in our heart that you don't see outwardly. There's a lot of hatred in people's hearts. And unforgiveness, prejudice, bitterness. There, it can be against your husband or wife or your children and the parents. You're going to be judged for it. This is why we have to change hearts. Through God, through the Holy Spirit, through salvation. That's why Matt Michael's uh, baptism today, his giving his life to Jesus is more important than any law that's ever going to be enacted about whatever's going on in this country about racism or hatred or unjust police. That's, that's a secondary issue, I'm sorry to say. The primary is, are you saved? Have you been given a new heart? Do you have the Holy Spirit in you? Are you being formed in the image of Christ? That's how we're going to change this country and this world. 
And it, by the way, it'll never all go away. When the, when the disciples got upset at the woman who poured out the expensive perfume onto Jesus' feet, onto Jesus, they were mad. And they said, we could have used this money for the poor. And Jesus rebukes them and said, look, dude, you're always going to have the poor, but you're not always going to have me. Social justice and social causes are good, but they don't take precedence over our love and our relationship with Jesus. And when we have that, when we have a real relationship with Christ, we will love our brothers. And we will do more than that because Jesus says, what good is it if you only love those who love you? Amen. He says to love those who hate you, to love your enemies. And that means, Mr. Police Officer, you have to love those that are not happy with you right now those that are cursing at you right now when they're protesting, and our protester friends. You cannot hate those in government or law enforcement officers. You can't hate the president, <laughs> okay? I, that's a, don't get me in trouble with this, okay? But I, I'm just gonna say one thing. I don't like someone taking the Bible and throwing it up in front of news cameras and standing in front of a church and using it for political propaganda. Now, you may disagree with me. Please do it offline. <laughs> I did not like that. And I, I just think it's wrong. And what we need to do is pray for everybody's salvation, including the president's, because he's done, he, you may not agree with this, but I think he's done some good things. Uh, please don't think this is a political message. I'm trying to get away from that. But what I'm saying is don't use God as your political platform, okay? That's another issue. I'm talking about real change, real salvation, and the real kingdom of God to come upon everybody. And, uh, but let's not make things worse. And let's not use God for our own advantage. This is kind of like a pastor who goes out and tries to earn money for himself through the gospel, you know, uh, excessive wealth. You know, that's wrong too. Uh, we're not, God is not your play toy. Don't do that. <laughs> He's going to hold you accountable, politician. He's going to hold you accountable, pastor, and, and all of us. He's going to look at your heart. Now, I don't know the president's heart. I can take a guess. But God knows his heart. God knows his heart, and he's going to judge the president. It's not up for us to hate him or, 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 or the police officers. Now, we're not supposed to take violent stands against things. And you can remember when Judas led the, the, the little group to arrest Jesus, and uh, Peter pulls out a sword, and he cuts off the servant's ear. And, and Jesus quickly said, put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Vigilante justice is not okay for a Christian. It is better for them to wrong us and to harm us for doing good than it is to reach out in vengeance and anger. It's very clear. You know, Paul was harmed by many people, and one of them was, a, I think his name was Alexander the Silversmith. And Paul said, he did me great harm. And he said, but God will repay him. And that's the way we have to be. Don't let anger come into your heart. It's God, God will sort this out. There, nobody's getting away with anything. And any crime that's been committed against you that this world, you don't see it corrected in this world, either by the legal system or, or at work or even in your family, that injustice will be dealt with by God. God will repay. You can guarantee it. They're not getting away with anything. And I'm not either. And we have to remember that. We have to hold ourselves accountable. Accountable because we're also under the same judgment. God is an impartial judge. Deuteronomy 16, verse 18. Deuteronomy 16, verse 18. <clears throat> you shall appoint judges and officers in all your towns that the Lord your God has given you according to your tribes, 
and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. You shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality. And you shall not accept the bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and subverts the cause of the righteous. Justice and only justice you shall follow, that you may live and inherit the land that the Lord your God is giving you. And, and you, you know, our police officers, our congressmen, all those protesters, every single one of us are held to the same standards. And we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift only. We are all sinners. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. James 2, uh, verse <clears throat> 1. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Verse 8, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. You can't show partiality. Romans 2, 9. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. Verse 11, for God shows no partiality. Pastor Bill, you have no favor with God. Pastor Bill, you are accountable. Your heart is accountable to God. Pastor Bill, you will stand for everything you have done good and evil before Christ. White, black, Asian, Latino, you're all lining up with me. Policemen, president, judges, we're all going to judge, be judged by Christ. And he is not a blind judge. He sees the heart. Thank God that he's in charge and we are not because our hearts are corrupt and we have trouble seeing things the right way. I'll tell you something that's shocking to me. It's not that I think people are wrong to protest legally against injustice by the police force or whatever the cause, but I am amazed at how virulent, how strong the protest is on certain issues. There has been I don't know, hundreds or maybe even thousands of African Americans that have probably died through prejudice and injustice by the police. That's my guess. I have no idea what the numbers are. But I'll tell you what the biggest killer is for, for African Americans. Do you know what it is? The biggest cause of death of African Americans is abortion. More people die, more black people die every year of abortion than any other clause. Murdered, babies are murdered. And by whom? Not by police officers. The mother. The father, the father who tells the mother to get an abortion. And then the father who leaves the mother and she can't afford and she's afraid. And then she, she does something she shouldn't do. And the father should have been in the home providing for that mother, providing for that child. You know, George Floyd had many children from different women. And one of his sons had, I, I just read a story about it, but one of his sons hadn't seen him since he was four years old. And the son and the mother said, see that man on the pavement getting his neck broken? That's your father. He goes, my father? He said, oh yeah, that was your dad. He, now the son was pretty cool because he said, well, you know, that's not right killing him, but it's also not right to go around destroying property and, and uh, protesting against, you know, be, being unwise with the police. That was George Floyd's son. So, um, but the crime to me, that there are more multiple crimes and of course murder by the police officer if he's found guilty of that. But uh, the great crime too is George Floyd not staying and raising his children. And, and if you're a godly man, if George Floyd were saved, he would have been at home with his kids, his wife, and he wouldn't have been passing false checks. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot going on there, okay? That doesn't make it right for that cop to kill him. 
And if that cop were saved, there's no way he would have put his knee into that man's throat for nine minutes. And you see the picture. I mean, that's all we have to go by. But he almost looks satisfied. He looks happy to be grinding this guy to, and killing him. I mean, he's, he, he's going to be tried. Now, the good thing about all the people that have had abortions, and even for the man that killed George Floyd, and even if George Floyd were alive, you can always repent. You can always repent and give your life to Jesus. And in su sincere confession of sin, you can be saved and forgiven. Now, that's what it's all about. And every crime can be undone. All of the murdered babies, all the women that murdered the children, they're all innocent under the blood of Jesus. And every police officer that murdered anybody unjustly who confessed their sin and sincerely repented and gave their life to Jesus is also innocent. I, you know, I'm just amazed at how blind people are by the news and by the spirit of this age. That so many people can passionately protest a right cause, but not realize the ones, even the ones protesting, have killed their own babies. They are murderers too. God is impartial until you've confessed and repented. I'm just 295,000 African American babies were aborted in 2017. 195,000 Latino babies, 280,000 white babies, and 77,000 other. I assume that's uh, Asians are always lumped in the other group. I don't know who else is in there. <laughs> American Indians, I guess. The other. It's nice to be the other, then people can't hate the other. You know, there's no prejudice against the other. Do you know, I, I read an article by an African American doctor about abortion and, and uh, African-Americans. I, I just read a little part of it here. <clears throat> Abortion impacts African-Americans at a higher rate than any other population group. In 2011, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention released an abortion surveillance report. According to that report, black women make up 14% of the childbearing population, yet 36% of all abortions were obtained by black women at a ratio of 474 abortions per, per 1,000 live births. Black women have the highest ratio of any group in the country. When you use those percentages, it indicates that of the over 44 million abortions since the 1973 Roe versus Wade Supreme Court ruling, 19 million black babies were aborted. White women are five times less likely to have an abortion than black women. Perhaps it is a matter of availability. A study by protecting black lives, I find that interesting. You've got Black Lives Matter, which they do. And then you also have protecting black lives, which they're trying to protect babies who are black. In 2012, found that 79% of Planned Parenthood surgical abortion facilities are located within walking distance of minority communities. Brothers and sisters, that's no accident. Because Margaret Sanger, the abortionist, started Planned Parenthood, and she believed in euthanasia not against white babies. She wanted to thin out the black population, and she believed abortion could do it. She also believed that you could get rid of mentally handicapped people and the infirm through abortion. And how on earth that the Democratic Party got so entwined with the propagation of abortion and Planned Parenthood is beyond me. And yet African Americans continue to vote for a party that is pro-death to African babies and Latino babies. You gotta be crazy to vote for someone that is pro-abortion, for someone that is they are ingeniously placing almost 80% of Planned Parenthood abortion clinics in black and Latino neighborhoods. That's murder. And you ought to get out and protest that. Black lives matter. Babies' lives matter. This, I, I'll tell you, this really makes me upset. And it's such a twisting of justice. 
Who, those babies can't protest. They're dead. And even if they're not dead, a baby can't protest. You protest. The, what happened to the, the abhorrence for abortion? What ha this is prejudice built into our institution, funded by the government to kill brown and black babies. Statistics here don't lie. The Nazis also followed this with euthanasia. They were a big proponent of Margaret, Margaret Sanger's teachings. It's evil, evil. In 2011, 360,000 black babies were aborted. In 2011, 287,000 black deaths occurred from all other causes, excluding abortion. Get your signs. Go out to the abortion clinics. Do you want to protest? Protest these murders. I'm not saying not to protest the other issues, but this is worse. And no one cares. They put it into political platforms. And now you're voting in favor of these murderers. Joe Biden, you call yourself a Catholic? And you say that you're in favor of abortion? Joe Biden, you say that you're in favor of black people? but you're in favor of Planned Parenthood being 79% of these walkable reach of, uh, of minorities, you're a murderer, you're a liar. And I'm not saying, as I said, I didn't agree with President Trump walking across with that Bible in his hand either and shooting tear gas at the protesters. But I also don't agree, this is even worse. Worse, this is worse. This is murder on a grand scale and God is impartial and he's holding you and me accountable. And when you pull that voter lever, you're gonna choose, you're gonna have two bad choices. <laughs> and I don't know which is worse, but I'll tell you, when it comes to abortion, you better think about that. That's a huge issue and it's a huge issue for me. And I'm not, I would say I'm apolitical, but I'm gonna say I'm gonna vote the best I can as a Christian right now. I don't know, and I'm not allowed to talk about it because we're a 501c3 now. <laughs> but what I'm going to do is encourage you to look at your Bible and vote the best you can. Now, maybe you don't vote. I'm sorry to say that. Maybe it's so bad, you don't want blood on your hands, and you're not going to vote. That's up to you, of course, and your conscience and the Holy Spirit. But just be aware, there's more than one issue here. There are a lot of things that you need to consider and uh, consider it in how you respond to the events that are going on. You're saved only through grace, through faith. And so are policemen, so are Black Lives Matter protesters, so are ladies that have had abortion, so are all of us. Thank God for the ability that God's given us through his grace, to give us faith to believe in Jesus. Thank you for Holy Spirit revealing Jesus to Michael and Alex and my, my wife's father and the people who have been baptized recently and to all of us that have been able to leave this wretched world of all its screwed up politics, racial injustice, racial hatred, and, and all of that. We've left that. We, have the, we are now in a new kingdom with new authority, with a new king, and we are to have a new mind. And if you're passionate about social issues, first be passionate about the kingdom. First be passionate about salvation. True righteousness is in the hands of our God, and you and I cannot escape his justice. No one, no one. Romans 6, 1 to 4, to bring us to a good moment. Oh, by the way, pray for this. It's amazing to me. I think it was 1973 or five was the peak of all abortions. They were almost at 1,600,000 abortions that year. And thank God, and I think it was 2018 or 2019, the number had gone down to 623,000 abortions. And I believe that's because of prayer. And I've, I've made it a, a point to pray as often as I can to remember of uh, uh, praying for uh, the babies, unborn babies, and the elimination of abortions in this nation and around the world. And it appears that 
start happening. All ethnic groups, all ethnic groups are lower than they were in 1975. So obviously that was Roe versus Wade. Everybody was so happy that it became legal in America to kill your baby. So they ran out and bought the Kool-Aid. And they believed because, wow, now we have real social, social justice and women have freedom and, and a right over their own body and men can't tell us what to do. You know, it's never been men, ladies. It's, it's been God uh, about murder, about protecting your child, loving your child. It's not about men and women. It's about God. And we need to keep praying so that that number keeps going down for all ethnic groups. Because there's a curse on this land. God's holding this country accountable because we have passed those abortion laws as a nation. Anyway, Romans 6, 1 to 4. And this applies to the baptism today. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. That's what's going on with Michael today. He's showing that he's dying to this filthy, disgusting world. And he's going to be new. He's a new man in Christ. He's got an opportunity to have a new mind. And the Holy Spirit will lead Michael as he allows him. And he's going to be a new creation. He's going to bring light to darkness. He's going to have a new heart that God promised to give him. Ezekiel 36, 24. Ezekiel 36, 24. I will take you from the nations, you see, everybody's included, and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. The baptism will be sprinkling new water on Michael today. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Amen. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. And then you'll be just. You see, he's going to give you the ability and the desire to follow his rules. And that's what God has done. When we've given him our life, we have repented. We no longer rely on our own thinking, on our own uh, ways, our own ability. We now trust the Lord. Let's, uh, let's pray about this and let's pray about our nation. Let's pray for all the babies. Let's pray for healing for women that have had abortions and for their testimony when they've been healed that they can help other women so that they don't do this or, or they need healing and salvation. Let's also pray for Michael and the blessing over Lisa and Brett and Michael and, his, and their family. And then uh, whenever you guys are ready, Brett, you, you tell us how much time you need to get ready with Michael and uh, we'll, we'll go through the baptism deal. All right, I'm going to pray to start, and then please, guys, join in. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the impartial judge and that you make no errors of judgment. We come humbly before you. We renounce all forms of prejudice and hatred uh, for whatever basis and, uh, and anger. And we lay those things at your feet. We renounce a political spirit that we're not going to be manipulated by political demons or demons of prejudice. God, please forgive us. We pray that you enlighten us to have compassion on other people. 
to feel what they feel and to love them, even those we call our enemy. We ask you to give us a heart of forgiveness towards them and love towards them and to be able to pray for them. We pray that we will not be lawbreakers and that our nation will not be lawless, both the police and the citizenry, that the police obey the same laws that they are ordained to protect and, and enforce, and we also, as citizens, will respect our police officers, our president, the government, and all laws. We pray that we'll respect and love one another as Americans. And remember always that our true kingdom, our true citizenry belongs to your kingdom, Jesus, and that you are our king. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.